survival of this inspiring experiment in social change. Ness sends aid, raises awareness and builds solidarity. Get involved at www.nesssolidarity.org.au. Ness is a 3CR supporter. What we're dealing with here is a total lack of respect for the law. You're listening to Done By Law, brought to you by the Federation of Community Legal Centres. Hello, and welcome to Done By Law on 3CR 855 AM. It's Tuesday the 12th of March 2024. And you're listening to a pre-recorded show with interviews conducted by Bonnie and Meg and pulled together by me, Tess. Uh, Firstly, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which 3CR is broadcasting tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to elders past and present. This land was stolen. Sovereignty was never ceded. The topic of our show this week is Lives After the Law, and we're talking to two guests who have previously worked in community legal centres, but are presently working in somewhat different fields. Uh, The first of those guests is Rhonda Blythman. Rhonda is a lawyer, scientist, psychic and medium. She is the Executive Secretary of the Australian Spiritual Alliance and currently works as a sole trader providing psychic and mediumship readings. Uh, Rhonda has also worked for and appeared on Psychic TV International since 2016. Bonnie and Meg interviewed Rhonda on the 20th of February. Thanks so much for joining us, um, Rhonda. Can you start by telling us about your life, particularly in the law? Where were you working? What did you do? Um, and And how does that relate to what you're doing now? Well, to start off, it doesn't relate at all. (laughs) I began my legal career in 2013 when I was admitted in Melbourne, and that was after a 20-year scientific career, so quite different. And also with that, I was a psychic medium from childhood. So my full-time business now is I'm a sole trader. I'm a psychic medium. I'm not doing science. I'm not doing law. I'm literally doing psychic and mediumship readings. Uh, But certainly in my legal career, I mostly practiced in community legal centres. I volunteered and practised as a law student um, and then I was practising in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, mid-north coast community legal centre, central coast community legal centre. I did my PLT at Loddon Compassby Community Legal Centre in Bendigo. I I like helping people and I like the aspect of community legal centres. I thought that was the best place to get people off the referral roundabout and get people help that they needed. So I, I've always wanted to help people and that's throughout my all of my careers. Uh, but what I'm doing now is very different from, from law. I'm curious, Rhonda, um, are there any similarities in terms of the skills that you needed in your experience working um, with clients at community legal centres or in other places and the skills that you might use now in your in your career as a, as a psychic? Like, did, were there any transferable skills at all or...? Oh, absolutely. I mean, certainly um, having legal knowledge helps me identify legal problems with my clients. And obviously I'm not, I I have insurance, but I don't give legal advice, but I can certainly direct people to a a CLC or legal aid to get legal help. So that's the first thing. I, in terms of business and managing my business, that obviously helps to have an analytical mind. But in terms of transferable skills, I certainly being non-judgmental and having good listening skills and being able to work out what the real issue is so you know step back from the emotion and and fine-tuning exactly what's going on they they're certainly transferable skills and obviously all lawyers um, often deal with people who are going through very difficult periods in their life so much the same as a psychic um, i guess The only difference would be is I also deal with a lot of grief with mediumship and people wanting to connect and and obtain evidence of survival of the soul. So that's a little bit different. Um, 
certainly when I was a lawyer, particularly when I did homeless clinics, I had a lot of mediumship come through. <laughs> there were a lot of people, a lot of clients that did have um, their loved ones around them, guiding them. So that was a little different and I had to sort of ignore that for the most part. Um, yeah, so it's it's quite an interesting question. It's certainly a lot of transferable skills, but there's also things I've really allowed to flow more so than I did when I was a lawyer. And I'm interested, you were saying earlier that you um, developed these your psychic skills when you were a child, which um, really is fascinating to me if you're willing to share about that and how you discovered it. But also, why do you think that it took you until more recently to decide to sort of pursue that? Absolutely. The first thing was confidence. It's, you know, I've, I've spent money on university for my science degree and postgrad and law and GDLP. And my analytical mind thought, well, I've paid all this money. I might as well have a respectable career. And it was as a matter of confidence in saying, no, actually, I've been doing this all my life. Now I'm doing this as my full time career. So that was that was the biggest thing. From childhood, I knew I was psychic. I had premonitions when someone was going to die or when a school teacher was sick or, you know, quite a lot of um, things. I'd, I'd tell mum not to drive a certain way because there's going to be a car accident or that sort of thing. And mediumship I became aware of when my grandfather died. He visited me in my bedroom and said, I'm, I'm going away now. I'm OK. I'm not cold anymore. I'll see you when your hair's my colour. So I knew that I was going to see him again when I was grey and I knew that he was okay he wasn't cold he was comfortable he was happy he was just saying goodbye and it turned out that in Windsor in Melbourne he fell over and was very cold and and, and pneumonia developed as a result of that so I, I was aware of a psychic medium from a young age and it certainly helped with both my scientific and legal careers it was more just allowing myself to do that completely um, I was I was doing psychic fairs on weekends when I was a lawyer, <laughs> when I was a scientist. So it wasn't completely new, it was just something I thought was a hobby, not realising it could be a career. And what about the things, I think you've kind of touched on this, but are there things that you, you know, anything that you miss about being a lawyer or things that you reflecting back, you know, what, what were the kind of best things about doing that work and some of the things that might have been a little bit more challenging and any differences, I suppose, between those things and, and what you do now? Absolutely. I, I do miss the analytical side of law and science. I I miss being sort of in that <laughs> that hemisphere of my brain. Um, and certainly in the psychic industry, there are it, it, it's open to a lot of criticism, but there are there's no sort of set standards or regulations of of readers. Um, and I'm I'm actually secretary of the Australian Spiritual Alliance and we're looking at doing that. So we've got a partnership with Scamwatch and that sort of thing. So I'm trying to bring in some of some of that into the psychic industry. And I do miss I do miss having the rules and um, having that structure, I, I guess. Um, in, in terms of any legal issues I've had in my life, it saved me money and it certainly helped my understanding. But I I still see legal issues a lot with clients in, in my psychic work and um, it does distress me a lot of the misinformation around, you know, backyard legal advice and that sort of thing. So I I miss law <laughs> and, and I sort of don't discount ever going back to law. But at this stage, this is this is what I want to do. Um, you were just mentioning um, uh, that you were working on the development of standards around in your industry, and I'm, I, I don't know if it's too soon to ask the question, but I'm just wondering how does that look? How, do, how does that come about? And does that mean you're authoring them from scratch or really interested Yeah, in that? Ab absolutely. There's been a few people um, over time who've had a go. Um, the Australian Spiritual Alliance, it's been in existence for about six years, and I've been part of it for four years. It's basically the, on our board, we have members that are quite experienced and quite diverse. So there's ministers, there's readers, uh, there's people sort of that have been in the industry much longer than me. Um, and it's really, uh, so we have insurance, we have standards, we have a constitution. So we're, we're looking at achieving that throughout and encouraging members to have insurance and, you know, a common misconception or a common thing I hear which I really don't like is people that say I don't need insurance because I'm guided by spirit well that's 
nonsensical because someone might rely on spiritual advice that you receive. So there are legalities with that. And and certainly, you know, previously it was illegal for us to do psychic readings, the Summary Offences Act. So we've come a long way and there's certainly people that are very intuitive and, you, you know, you can be intuitive or you can be psychic and you don't need to be doing what I'm doing. You can use that work out who you're going to hire or how you're going to do something. So in, in, intuition is important and I believe that everyone has psychic ability um, and particularly for people who do readings or do, you know, do what I'm doing, we like to have some sort of standards or regulations and that's what we're, we're trying to do. The last question we'd like to ask you is just whether, you know, now you've sort of stepped away from the law and you're in this, you know, quite different, but as you've said, somewhat related area of work, you know, what are your reflections on your career, your studies in the law, um, you know, any kind of reflections on what that was like, what what might have been missing that you wish you had known and, and whether or not it's a career that you would sort of recommend for other people close to you, friends, family? Yeah, absolutely. I For me, I didn't know anyone in the law. I started law because I knew someone who was murdered. So that was a bit of an extreme thing to do, <laughs> go and do a law degree. I I felt like there could have been more support for mature age students. Um, I was actually involved in mentoring programs, but I had a really good mentor, um, but he unfortunately died. So <laughs> sort of, I, I tried to do what was logical, but it didn't sort of flow. Um, also, I struggled with job security. I had a lot of maternity relief contracts, including outside CLCs. And by the time I actually got a full-time permanent position, um, I didn't enjoy the role as much as when I was volunteering at that CLC, so that was really interesting. Um, and certainly, um, I I relied on my spirit guidance to transition full time into my career. So, uh, for example, I asked my spirit guides for a really clear sign, and my name disappeared off the shared calendar. So that was when I was working, practicing as as a lawyer. So that was really interesting. Um, that that happened. I, I felt really drawn to doing what I'm doing. But certainly reflecting on my legal career, I I wish I had better job security and I wish I had a bit more support um, in terms of I was, um, I had a, un, I still had a restricted practicing certificate, but I was, um, for example, looking after PRT students and supervising them. So it felt, almost felt like I'd stepped into a management role rather than sort of a legal role. So, um, yeah, that's that's sort of my take, whether that's my personality and I took on that responsibility. Um, but yeah, I, I would certainly like to see more support for mature age students. And that was Rhonda Blythman, lawyer, scientist, psychic and medium. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Our second guest for this week's show is Sam Elkin. Sam is the host of 3RRR radio show Queer View Mirror and ABC's The History Listen, Crossing Time, A History of Transgender Australia. Sam is also a co-editor of Nothing to Hide, Voices of Trans and Gender Diverse Australia, and his debut book, Detachable Penis, A Queer Legal Saga, is due to be released in May this year. Again, we have Bonnie and Meg interviewing Sam. Um, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Maybe you could start with giving us a brief background of what it was like for you working in the law and whether there's any correlation between the work you were doing when you were in legal practice um, and if there's any connection with what that and what you're doing today. Yeah, well, I started working as a lawyer in, oh, I think it was 2015 or 16. I started volunteering um for the Aboriginal Legal Aid Service in Alice Springs and ended up working for the Darwin Community Legal Centre. Um, and I ended up working for Victoria Legal Aid because I got into the New Lawyers Program. So I had a great opportunity to learn about all different areas of practice. Um, and then I ended up uh, signing up to do a job uh, working at the LGBTIQ Legal Service, which was run by um, St Kilda Legal Service, now Southside. And yeah, so I was basically um, tasked with setting up a health justice partnership with Thorn Harbour Health and um, yeah, running a specialist community legal service for the LGBTIQA plus community. So 
um, yeah, it was an interesting job. It was definitely linked to my kind of personhood because um, I was transitioning at the time. I'm a member of that community and, um, yeah, previously worked as like a queer officer, you know, for La Trobe Student Union. So, yeah, in some ways it was quite similar to some of the sort of social justice work I'd done as a student. Um but yeah, now I am not working in the law. I'm doing something totally different. And But I've just written a book about my experiences of working in the law at the LGBTIQ Legal Service. So while I'm not working in the law, I've certainly spent an awful lot of time um, thinking about it and the impact it's had on me and whether I've had any impact on, you know, society for better or worse. And maybe just before we go on to the next question, we'll just give you an opportunity to um, do a little spruik of that book if you like. Sam, where can where can people uh, get copies of, of that book? Yeah, so it's called um, Detachable Penis, A Queer Legal Saga, and it's coming out with Upswell Publishing um, in May. So it's coming out on the 3rd of May. So you'll be able to get it, yeah, from pretty much any, you know, local independent bookshop, or you can get it off the Upswell website as well. But um, yeah, should should be able to wander in and get it wherever you go and get your books. Um, it, it sounds like the clinic you were running was, um, you know, quite um, spearheaded and would have been doing some really amazing work for people in the community. Was there, what was the thing that made you decide to shift away from doing legal work? And were there any things you were like, concerned about in terms of that moving away? Yeah, so really, you know, what this book is all about, and I suppose why I've spent so much time thinking about it is like, why could I have got what I considered to be my dream job? And then like two and a half years later, uh, never want to work in the law ever again, uh, which was kind of tragic in some ways, because obviously, as you know, um, it takes a while to train to be a lawyer. So to stop doing it is pretty um, big decision. Uh, definitely the issue for me was burnout. Um, I yeah, had so much work to do. I had so much casework, so much like stakeholder management type work. Um, obviously the LGBTIQA plus community has heaps of, you know, health services, justice organisations, um, heaps of law reform stuff that we needed to do. Um, very poorly funded sector. So, you know, as is the community legal centre sector. So, yeah, huge part of my day to day job just ended up being like um, shaking the can, trying to get money um, to basically keep my job and to expand the service to stop me from drowning at work, which, um, <laughs> you know, perhaps unsurprisingly ended up in me drowning in more like grant application acquittals and, you know, meetings with people to discuss things and then managing staff. And yeah, it just got a bit out of control in terms of the workload, which, you know, I think is super familiar for anyone who's worked in a community legal center. You know, you want to do a good job and um, yeah, you ended up being, you know, inundated with, you know, humans who need support and deserve support and, um, you know, being able to kind of, do a good job um, in a sort of trauma-informed way for people and uh, running a service on the smell of an oily rag, like a really counterposed. So, um, yeah, you know, I just got to a point where I couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, thankfully other people have, have taken over and, and carried in the baton, which is great. Um, and yeah, I'm really sad I'm not working in the law anymore. You know, I haven't found a job that I've found as personally meaningful or that I was as good at or suited to, not to say I was perfect, but you know, I, I liked the law. I liked doing social justice work and I'm really passionate about the LGBTIQA plus community and law reform in that space. So yeah, certainly sad to not be working in it, but, um, you know, at some point you've got to kind of like prioritize your own mental health because you know without that you kind of can't do anything. I think Sam you've raised something really interesting there which is I think it's obviously it's fantastic that we're moving towards models where there's more lived experience and you know involving the voice of lived experience in you know non-government and non-government settings to make sure that that experience can be fed directly into policy and practice but you know that obviously comes at a huge emotional toll I mean the work that you were doing in that service it's not abstract for you I mean maybe it's not really ever abstract for anyone but I mean that that has direct implications for for your life and your community um you know I know that's a really big question but any kind of reflection on on that tension and what you sort of see as as potentials for models moving forward 
Yeah, I when I was working there, I actually met um, someone who was running a Pacifica legal clinic for West Justice, and I was really interested in talking to them because I found that there were heaps of synergies between my work and their work, and you know some of the complexities of working in community and having to be a conduit between you know your community and the legal profession and your own colleagues, and also kind of be a stand-in representative of the state in some ways and, you know, have to explain the shortcomings of capitalism to, you know, people who are, you know, look like you and sound like you, that sort of thing. Um, I think for me, the fact that the organisation I worked for, and, you know, this is not to sort of pay out on them because I really appreciate them giving it a red hot go, but I think the lack of kind of governance knowledge on our board at that time was a big issue. Um, I think that if you're going to run a service that is sort of focusing on a particular, you know, area of cultural identity or, or personal attribute, you kind of need people on the board who really know and care and are passionate about the work and are going to sort of take some of the work of, you know, grant applications or, you um, you know, sector networking, things like that, people that have the credibility in the sector because, yeah, because I was like the trans lawyer. <laughs> like I just can't tell you how many meetings that I had to attend that spe weren't specifically my job, but because so much of the kind of project relied on like my credibility as having this particular attribute, um, yeah, a lot of that work fell on me. And yeah, I think if I was talking to people that were considering setting up something like that in future, whether it's around trans or LGBTIQ stuff or another identity or, you know, ethnicity. Um, I think, yeah, having leadership that is invested, trained, knows about it, can carry that social work in the community. And like, if you don't have that, they'd partner with an organisation, develop a link and actually like make it sound um, and nurture it before trying to start it because yeah, it's an incredibly stressful job um, doing that sort of work and, yeah, setting up mental health support and debriefing and not having to have your staff member, like, ask for that stuff because particularly when, you know, you are kind of starting to be under siege from, like, too much fire work, that's kind of the last thing you want to do because it's just more time. Um, but I think setting up those processes at the beginning would be a really, really good idea. I just wondered if, um, speaking from the perspective of someone who's still in the law and it being mm. quite a combative type of environment to work in, whether you had any reflections on what it's like to be an advocate in a non-legal space um, as opposed to, uh, you know, fighting in court or fighting with others um, and whether that you, it gives you pause to reflect on, you know, the path you chose and, um, you know, do you find that? Do you find the legal advocacy is something that is quite, um, can be quite challenging because of it's about fighting a lot of the time? Mm. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny you say that, Bonnie, because I actually kind of miss that world. Like <laughs> in the kind of non legal world, it's all about sort of like, slow discussions and community building and that's really really important but um I guess because I have do have that legal background and you know and probably uh yeah naturally kind of a, more of an analytical person that likes to kind of discuss things and get a yes or a no and then move on um actually working in community you know because I've done a lot of kind of like community organizing type jobs since then you really need to bring down the pace and learn that the relationship kind of is the project. Um, I think there's a book called that, which is very helpful. And um, I've really had to kind of like retrain myself to kind of slow down and not just be looking for, okay, we're on, like, you know, you get adrenaline from that work. Um, as I'm sure you know, like, it's great. You know, it's it burns you out and it makes you kind of question your life choices but um it's also really interesting work that is intellectually stimulating and um I do miss it and yeah learning that you know um winning or losing is not very important in community building it's just building the you know you don't it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong um building the relationship is central so yeah I've had a lot to learn 
Well, I feel like you've kind of left it open there, Sam. It sounds like you might be <laughs> you might be coming back to a life in the law maybe <laughs> at some point. That was sort of the I feel like this is maybe maybe you'll be on our lives returning to the law, the sequel episode. That's right. Or oh, it'll be the resurrection <laughs> episode. Yes. <laughs> no, but that's, zombie I legal think... aid lawyers. <laughs> um, no, that's. I think extremely interesting and also something that I think we can learn as a profession, kind of this idea that we can move in and out of practice and non-practice and that we can gain a lot of kind of perspective and valuable skills while doing that. I also think is something that we as a profession could kind of um, sit up and take note of other professions, like in the social sciences, like social work, where that's sort of much more of a, of a, of a built in feature of that, of the kind of work to prevent burnout um, and also to increase like professional capacity will be something interesting for us to think about. Totally. But yeah, thank you so much, Sam. Um, just to recap for everyone, Detachable Penis will be available at your local independent bookstores from, was it the 3rd of May, Sam? 3rd of May, yep. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, great to chat to you. Thanks for having me. That was Sam Elkin and Rhonda Blythman generously sharing their lives after the law with Done By Law. And that's the end of our show for tonight. Uh, please stay tuned uh, for Voice of West Papua. The media in this country, we as Indigenous people know, have censored our right of telling the truth. And the truth is what this country is most fearful of, in particular Indigenous truths. Until history is told by the vanquished lens, which is our people telling our story our way, and have the right to be able to incorporate that into a system of learning. Well, people are always going to be denied that truth by deceit and lies. When you look at the type of psychological warfare, spiritual warfare that Aboriginal people are caught in, it's not just in the sense of military when they talk about weapons of mass destruction, but you're right, it's in terms of the media and the industry of media as a warfare against our people and so is religion, I believe, in the Western sense. They're, they're all weapons of mass destruction against our, our people. We need to keep radical voices on air. Subscribe now. Go to 3cr.org.au forward slash subscribe or call the station on 9 419 8377. Consumer Law touches on many aspects of what we do every day. Consumer Action Law Centre has lawyers, financial counsellors and policy experts who specialise in issues such as unfair contract terms and deceptive or dodgy business practices like excessive pricing or irresponsible lending. Consumer Action Law Centre provides free legal information and advice and pursues litigation on behalf of consumers experiencing disadvantage across Victoria. Consumer Action Law Centre currently focuses on getting justice for people who have been sold lemon cars, ripped off by insurance companies, scammed and denied help from their bank, or refused hardship concessions from telecommunications and energy companies. Find out how Consumer Action Law Centre can help you at consumeraction.org.au. The Federation of Community Legal Centres is a 3CR supporter. No AUKUS, no war, peace. Rally to reject spending $368 billion on nuclear submarines and US-led wars rather than health, education, housing, people's needs and climate crisis. Come to the rally on Saturday the 16th of March at 1pm at the State Library, Victoria. Speakers include MUA Assistant State Secretary David Ball, former ALP Senator and member of Labor Against War Margaret Reynolds, Australia-Palestine Advocacy Network's NASA Mashni, mental health nurse and ANMF delegate Jackie Kriz, Black People's Union Kieran Stewart Asherton and Greens Senator-elect Steph Hodgins-May. No AUKUS, no war, peace. Rally, Saturday the 16th of March, 1pm at the State Library. The No AUKUS Coalition Victoria is a 3CR supporter. The revolution in Rojava is a beacon of hope for the world. 
putting direct democracy and feminism into practice on a broad scale. This radical attempt at social transformation now faces huge challenges, including daily attacks by the Turkish military with little outside recognition or aid. Show your support for Rojava by joining North East Syria Solidarity, or NEWS, NES, and help ensure the survival of this inspiring experiment in social change. NES sends aid, raises awareness, and builds solidarity. Get involved at www.nessolidarity.org.au. NES is a 3CR supporter. I'm Deborah Cheatham Freon, and you're listening to 3CR. Stay tuned and stay radical. Was we live, was